Hello, crafties, and welcome to another edition of the Arena Craft Podcast, a show dedicated exclusively to Magic the Gathering Arena and all that is epic in the world. My name is Arjuna the Great and Voluminous, and introducing the co-host of the show, Covert Go Blue, the often coveted the mystery mage, the man in the ivory tower. How's it going, Kovac Goblin? It's me. <laughs> it's CGB. Yeah, is this supposed to be a demon voice or dragon voice? Because I, I get just, torn. I don't know. I'm it's, just doing my... <laughs> actually, maybe it's my like fight announcer voice, you know? I'm in the ring. Hmm. <laughs> but I, I kind of like this demonic CGB that's coming out. We all knew it was that. It's based on the animated version of The Hobbit has the dragon smog voiced by, it's like famous, somebody famous, right? Oh, God. Why is it? I'm blanking on it. Was it James Earl Jones? Did he do the voice? Yeah, like Darth, the Darth Vader guy or whatever. It is like the the smog the dragon in the animated version of the Hobbit is just so great. It's just so yeah. Gross. He's got that really deep rumble. He's like, mm, revenge. <laughs> and yeah, I just love that's, it. that's exactly what a big greedy covetous dragon should sound like, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. A little voice acting here to open the show today because so, that's what the arena is all about. Indeed, indeed. Uh, fun voices and. I, I just figured it out, CGB. So this is why you look so youthful, is that you actually sold your soul to a demon, right? And uh, and then I assume at some point you slayed the demon. So here we are. I'm not supposed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> You're making this awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and moving right along. So yes, yeah, so today... New Capanna spoilers, a lot of spoilers just hit. Uh, It's going to be a fun time. We're going to spend most of the show talking about those. So pretty stoked. But first of all, one of the deadly duo has spent a little bit of time dicking around in the alchemy format with the new rebalancing. And I'd be very much curious to hear how it's been going with all the elves and all the other nonsense over in alchemy. Yeah, alchemy rebalancing hit on Thursday. We're recording on Friday. I did a seven-hour stream. I think three of it was devoted to the new Capenna reveal, and I think uh, another four-ish was devoted to trying out elves and warriors, warriors slash equipment in alchemy. And um, like none, none of it is nearly as good as just playing the new black cards from alchemy. So uh, th- there is. I, like, I was really impressed by Arm Scavenger, which is the warrior that uh, fetches a card from Spellbook every upkeep. Uh, sometimes the opponent wouldn't kill it, and you'd have access to all kinds of cool weapons, and they would make your Nahiri Minus deal like 14 damage or something grossly absurd to a creature or Planeswalker, which was always kind of funny. The elves, uh, Tyvar Kell is a real gamer now. The plus one putting two counters on an elf means it attacks for a ton of damage. And the fact that you can untap the elf means you can also play really good defense with it if you choose to do it that way. You can also generate a ton of mana, basically mana doubling when you play Tyvar, which lets you cast things like Hagra Mauling when the opponent tries to attack you. So those cards are a lot better. It's just every time I ran into a black deck, I was like, I can't win. I have creatures in my deck, and they have Meat Hook Massacres and Invoke Despair and various other tools of the trade for that format, and they're like, there's nothing I could really do. And I didn't run into Divine Purge at all, but I imagine the feeling's at least kind of similar. So I think that both tribal decks got nice pushes to give them a little bit more juice on what they were already doing, but I still wouldn't play either of them in a serious alchemy event i uh yep i hear that i mean it sounds like these black based decks especially rakdos seem to have just kind of like a stranglehold on the meta at the moment uh which is definitely one of the reasons i've been giving it a wide berth um so are we basically just like waiting until new capenna hits for alchemy to be a more diverse meta game i don't know what to do with alchemy i enjoy playing it 
the meta game is actually really diverse because I don't think there's a real meta. Like, there aren't many places to net deck. You can net deck from Crokies when he plays Alchemy, but he doesn't play it all the time. Most people don't play Alchemy all the time. So you actually run into a lot of different decks. It's just that, I don't know. I, we talked about it a little last week, and it really sunk in for me again this week, that when the the buffs are to things like warriors and elves, it doesn't feel special. It doesn't feel meant for the competitive player. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I it, it seems that the venture thing happening might have been a rare instance, and maybe I'm missing it because I'm not diving deep enough into elves, warriors, or the power of base camp, but like those don't feel like buffs targeted at me. They feel like buffs targeted at very casual magic that doesn't really concern with win rate and just wants to play what they want to play. And that it, it takes a lot of the fun out of like, like I, I would love for buff day to be a, like a big deal. I, I would love to be excited yeah. to log in and try these things, but trying them is just like, yeah, it's still the same stuff with a little more juice. And I still feel like I should be playing better cards, you know? So, yeah, I, I totally agree. It feels like a format that's currently designed. It almost feels like they're just trying to get more mileage out of the cards they've designed, right? Instead of actually like thinking about how the format would be interesting and then going from there. Yes, and uh, I agree. Yeah, and I do, I think like, I wish, like if they wanted to have that design focus, I wish it would be maybe like, okay, this update's focused on buffing Venture, and then this next update is just like a whole bunch of almost competitive cards that we made more competitive, right? I wish they would at least do like a one-on, one-off kind of a thing instead of it just seems like every update they're like picking a new failed mechanic for, for constructed play and trying to make it playable. And uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's a big turnoff for competitive players. And quite frankly, you know, because the play numbers are low on Alchemy anyway, I feel like the only person, who, people who are really invested in the format are probably a little bit more competitive, or at least people who, you know, would probably be more interested in a, a pretty dense and competitive meta game. Yeah. And for those with the economy concerns right now, there is an event going. <laughs> Sorry. There is an event going. And you can play with all the Alchemy cards for free right now in the event. Like you, yeah, you can play with cards that you don't own. So I didn't have to craft four Tyvar Kells or four Nahiris to try out the decks. So there is that option right now. Here's what, here's the kind of buffs as a spike I'd like to see. I would like to see them take good cards and at least for a little while try them just great at like mm. unseen rates. Let's, okay, Arjuna, would you be excited if they announced that next Thursday all of the legendary dragons from Kamigawa with dies triggers instead had leaves the battlefield triggers. That would be pretty gas. And, 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 and that's five different dragons, mm -hmm. five different colors, five mythics. That's only five cards compared to like the 20 or so that they've changed the last few times they've done these updates. If you change those five cards in a way that made them seem really powerful and like encourage a whole different kind of deck building, like, how many different kinds of decks would I try to play with those dragons? They're, they're in every color combination, you know? Everybody gets a shot yeah. at something cool to do, as opposed to having to be a warrior gamer or an elf gamer, which I don't I don't even understand how, how many of those... I, I'm sure there's a good number, but I, I can't imagine it's that big of a number to move the needle that they log in on April 7th to play their new buffed elves, you know? Yeah, well, I also think... See, the, the way that they're doing it right now is like very safe, right? It's like if they if they buff Venture, if they buff Elves too hard, then it's like it's one very discreet chunk in the meta game, and I suppose they can adjust it from there. Whereas if they make a bunch of, like let's say they did just buff like every single one of those legendary dragons, um, they could just end up being super powerful cards that would show up all over the place. And maybe they're a little bit worried about that. But I also think like, that's the whole promise of the format, right? And so I totally agree with you. Like, why don't they take these, you know, mythic cards that maybe people crafted and then got disappointed about and just try to make them better. And, and I agree, like just take a random powerful card and see if it can actually be a player in the format. Like, I don't see any reason why they're not doing more of that. So again, to me, it feels... 
it feels a little lazy and it feels a little like greedy from a design perspective. Uh, and I'm just, I'm not here for it so far. All right. Well, I know that a lot of people aren't, so they're probably thrilled to have us move on to our next topic, which is new cards. New cards. <laughs> cards oh, yeah. that have probably been pretty well tested. So, uh, yeah. Maybe. Hopefully. <laughs> Let's, uh, yeah, CGB cracks his drink and settles into his chair for probably his second or third uh, run through of these cards already. I haven't seen any of the cards that were revealed today. Okay, that's exciting. Yep. So, do you want to do you want to start from newest first, or do you want do you want to go in chronological order? Uh, let's see. I'm on Scryfall. I'm okay. going to start at the top. I don't know. Do you want to like go from the bottom, and we'll just grab cards we like and bounce them off each other? Sounds good to me. Okay. All right. Well, let's start by finishing the charm cycle. Okay. Because uh, there's two that we haven't read on the show so far. And I think that they are the two best ones that I've seen so far, in my opinion. So um, let's start with Riveteer's Charm. This is the Jund Charm. It costs black, red, green. It is an instant at Uncommon. And it says, choose one. Target opponent sacrifices a creature or planeswalker they control with the highest mana value among creatures and planeswalkers they control. Or exile the top three cards of your library until your next turn you may play those cards. Or exile target player's graveyard. So, you know, I feel like this is a pretty sweet charm. I mean, the fail case of exiling the top three and having this turn and next turn to play them is, uh, I think that's pretty good. This could potentially be a three for one. And uh, especially in a deck that plays a bunch of cheap stuff. And I think that that looks pretty good to me. And then, of course, you know, if you're making them sack a big threat or if you're exiling their graveyard, there's probably a reason for that. So on the face of it, I think this card looks pretty cool. I agree with you. I think this is the charm right here, the the, the one that should get people excited. And I think that Jund is a color combination that needed it because oftentimes Jund is a bit of a meme these days because you, you there, it just doesn't seem to do all the things it seems to be able to do the things but not at great rate if that makes sense this card combines already a playable magic card soul shatter which sees fringe play and specific case play uh with a potential three for one which i don't think any of the other charms can say that they do so right away your potential for card advantage is just significantly higher uh, you actually get something at that you don't see at this rate you don't see three mana draw three in junt ever right so um that that is unique among the charm cycle whereas usually you're getting we see this effect in a better rate most of the time and then the exile target player's graveyard this is a car this is a very narrow effect right but when it hits sometimes it hits hard um mm. I, i'm thinking of when the opponent cycles shigeki to get three or four cards back on end step and you take out their whole graveyard that might have been their whole game plan right there they they were trying to grind you all the way out with shigeki and now they don't get to so um it's a narrow effect that can have devastating consequences so i love this charm yeah i think it's really good um i think it's likely to see play in both standard and historic um I just, yeah, it seems so versatile and, and powerful. I think it's pretty good. What about Baroka's Charm? I'll read Bonkers Charm if you want me to read Bonkers Charm. <laughs> I'm, I'm down for the Bonkers. Let's go. I can't unsee Bonkers Charm now. It, it's not there, but I saw it somehow. You just flip the O <laughs> and the R and you put a little tail on the R and you've got Bonkers and, Charm. And, and it's too close. Go. It's too close for comfort. So... <laughs> Uh, this is a green, a white, and a blue for an instant. Choose one target creature you control gets plus one plus zero oh until end of turn. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker an opponent controls. Next mode, destroy target enchantment. Next mode, draw two cards. The it's not a fight, it's a bite. So that's the first thing I want to point point out. It's like a rabid bite, not a fight spell. So you don't. It doesn't gain the indestructible like a blizzard brawl, but it probably doesn't need it because you're just dealing your damage to something else. So that's nice. Yep. Draw two cards isn't bad. Instant speed draw two cards isn't isn't normal these days. I, I was going to say, does that make you feel like 
a little spiteful that it was the Bant one and not the Espo one that got that ability? A little, but I think it makes sense for balancing the charms because your one mode really wants you to have a creature, but draw two cards is for three mana at instant speed is normally something you see from people who don't want to play creatures. <laughs> If that makes sense. Yeah. And then yeah. uh, destroy target enchantment is super narrow, but there are enchantment creatures in the format right now, so maybe it's better than it looks. It's mm -hmm. okay. Could be relevant in the future. Yep, the card definitely isn't doing anything... Like, like two of its modes are, prob are well above rate, or I guess worse than rate? What's the right term? I don't know. Yeah, um, below, but, below rate, yeah. right? Yeah, so yeah, below rate on the fighting, below rate on destroy target enchantment. That's in line with the other charms. Instant speed, three mana, draw two cards isn't something you see in blue very much. You see it in some kind of crafty conditional ways through other colors. So I guess that's okay. And that gets used in Archmage's charm a lot. So I, I think this is the second best charm, mostly on the draw two mm. cards, but you know I'm gonna overvalue that yeah by, by nature. and and in in certain deck archetypes draw two is better than exile three you may play until the end of the next turn right if you're if you're looking to play a longer game if you're playing a lot of counter spells stuff like that you'd probably much rather get that draw two so um yeah i think that this is going to find a home in plenty of decks uh unless the the color combination is just completely unplayable yep pretty cool so. but pretty 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 bonkers charm pretty good yeah yeah i uh, i think it's pretty sweet um all right cgb what's what's the next card on this list that really stands out to you i'm going to talk about mysterious limousine this okay. is three white white for a four four artifact vehicle at rare when it enters the battlefield or attacks exile up to one other target creature until mysterious limousine leaves the battlefield if a creature is put into exile this way return each other card exiled with mysterious limousine to the battlefield under its owner's control crew too what do you think of this card so i mean yeah basically the joke is that you're supposed to be like switching out creatures right as you go along um i think it's a pretty sweet design some things i'm thinking about are like exile a token and it's just gone which yeah. is nice yeah. and there are a lot of tokens in the format so this could be like an, an easy two for one if your opponent has tokens and then maybe they have to trade for it in combat so it's like a three for one so i mean yeah that's pretty cool blinking it again is kind of mows down tokens which is nice uh, the crew two is pretty low, so I like that. It's also kind of pricey though, so eh, I mean, okay, it's it's definitely like a better brutal Cathar. It costs five mana, so of course that's a thing, right? But um, your opponent's going to have a lot harder of a time killing it, so I, I don't know. And it survives board wipes and stuff like that, so I think there are ways in which this card could be pretty sweet. The costing five mana is pretty steep. So, what if does this make you maybe want to try some faithful mending into Grease Fang shenanigans? I mean, you know, that could be a thing. That could be a thing. Yeah, we don't have Parhelion in standard, so Grease Fang hasn't had a very big impact. But I mean, this comes yeah. down and does some removal. I'll also say it's really good against legendary creatures because you take a legendary creature, they play another one, you just uh, attack with this, swip, you know, flip them, and they have to sacrifice one of them, and then you take the other one. <laughs> is is that the way the ordering works on that? Not necessarily. So it says <laughs> if a creature is put into exile this way, return it, but it's still kind of, you know. You, you'll eventually get the one you gave back. <laughs> Maybe I take suppose. something else in the meantime. Also, just yeah. this card with Yorian sounds like you can do so many stupid things. It's it's my idea of nonsense. Or with Teleportation Circle, perhaps, where you're constantly putting your own creatures in the limousine, but, and then when you let them out, right. you get a, you know, there's a trigger when you let them out, there's a trigger when you put them in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, that's the thing that people might not, a first catch about this is that it can target any creature, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I could even see some crafty shenanigan, like um, like you crew up your chariot, send in, make a token, post combat, you put the chariot in the limousine, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. uh, next turn you put something else in there, chariot comes back, you get two more cats. 
I don't know, maybe it's Christmas land, but we're also talking about a hypothetical vehicles deck. So, eh? dude, my last, my last set review became things that go well with chariot and uh, <laughs> we're already on our way in this one as well. So there you go. Yeah. Definitely an interesting card to keep an eye on. Um, do we want to go into these basic lands don't look like the lands that's supposed to look like chat or are we already done with that? These basic lands don't look like the lands they're supposed to look like, Chet. So you're telling me that all these skyscrapers aren't mountains? <laughs> Is that what you're trying to say? I've seen an awful lot of complaining are, on social media about this. Are you telling this? me that this fountain uh, on the edge of a skyscraper, I can barely tell there's water here, is an island? That's not an island? What? <laughs> There's uh, definitely some open to interpretation stuff happening here for sure. Yeah, yeah, very, but, very strong interpretation. We we didn't we we did the thing about the train station and the planes, right? We we did. Yeah, yeah okay. we did. So we don't really need to revisit that. Okay. Uh, but you know, I will say that there is not a scrap of grass to be found in either of these planes. So you know. Take that as it will. I think that people who complain about that are closer to the letter of the law than the spirit of the law, but that just happens to be my opinion. I think we should finish the cycle of the um, the family bosses. Oh, yeah, that's right. We got some more, didn't we? Yep, we, we have the Jund and the Bant uh, family bosses to cover. So, yeah, where are they, though? Just a little up, not very far. They're a little further up. Yeah, yeah, why don't you take us into it? All right, we're going to start our family boss time with Zia Tora. Zia, Zia Tora? Zia, I don't know. Zia Tora. Zia Tora. The incinerator. Nice. Three and a black green. Wait, wait, hold on. No, it actually has to be Zia Tora, the incinerator. Legendary creature, demon, dragon. Okay, cool. We're good. All right, Flying Mythic 6-6. Six, six. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice another creature. When you do, this card deals damage equal to that creature's power to any target, and you create three treasure tokens. Three. It flings. Them's, it them's literally a flings of... a creature every end step. Yep. I mean, okay, probably more sweet than good, but it is a powerful effect. It can fling those dragons from Kamigawa and get you those death benefits. I'm I'm there I'm on a go. mission, he's, man. I he's want on them it, to be man. good. I want them he to is, be good. The man who's usually off it is now on it. <laughs> uh yeah. This looks like a fun commander card. Um hard for me to imagine it seeing play in furrowed brow magic, but uh, stranger things have happened, I suppose. I agree. Probably a fun card, and I'm curious to see what people want to do with it. If people are going to try to body of research into this, you know, <laughs> yeah, there, there's some way to cheat those two out at the get 12 <laughs> mana in the same turn, right? <laughs> yep, yep. I mean, you know, this is no Corvold, so let's let's just kind of hold up our expectations there. Like, I don't think we have another like uh, genre defining mythic legendary creature going on here but um someone's gonna have fun with it speaking of cards somebody might have fun with mm. I'll, I'll do a falco spara the pact weaver now is there any particular voice you want to read this card in or should i just go for it i mean you know falco spara sounds pretty good as well i guess <laughs> <laughs> He's a legendary creature bird demon. So this is Harvey Birdman practicing bird law. Yeah. Give, give him the bird. <laughs> I guess so. Um, <laughs> bird demon, 3-3. Three, three. One and a bant, so one green, white, blue, four total mana. Flying trample. When it, when Falco Sparta Pact Weaver enters the battlefield with a shield counter on it, and you may look at the top card of your library at a time, and you may cast spells from the top of your library by removing a counter from a creature you control in addition to paying their other costs. Now, we haven't done a shield creature yet, right? Mm -hmm. Something with a shield yeah, counter? So yep. the parenthesis text on a shield counter is if it would be dealt damage or destroyed, remove a shield counter from the creature instead. What do you think about shield counters? What are they going for here? Uh, it just sounds 
flipping annoying to me is what it sounds like. I mean, just think about this, right? You can't hit this with Vanishing Verse. You can't kill it with any destroy effect, right? That basically leaves like waiting for your opponent to attack with it and just like nicking it with your freaking Wandering Emperor. Um, or maybe we're going to be seeing a lot of Rite of Oblivion in this upcoming set. But other than that, like it's just looking very annoying to deal with any of this shield counter nonsense. And there's, there's like quite a few creatures in the set that have it. So I don't really know what they were going for, honestly. To me, it just seems like a really obnoxious mechanic. Like I think if there's one creature that has it, it's kind of cool. But otherwise, to me, I just like, it's not necessarily that it's like super OP. I just think that so many decks are going to look at a shield counter creature and just be like, ugh, you know. Now I have to deal with that stupid thing. So is it like fixed regeneration? It's like one shot regeneration, kind of. It's kind of a little bizarre. I mean, it doesn't get you around exile because why would it? It doesn't get you around minus X minus X. You know, the things that people mm -hmm. do with meat mm -hmm. hook massacres and such. Um, but one thing that's interesting about the shield counter, like any damage breaks it. So if you somehow get a one one to bounce token to like bump into this thing it breaks the shield counter oh really i mean it does say it doesn't say lethal damage it says if it would be dealt damage or destroyed mm, okay yeah so, that's interesting to know yeah that's pretty weird i'm not sure how it's going to play in the long run i think it makes like disposable creature tokens or like little pings of damage like a mayhem devil might do even more valuable and mm. I don't think it's pure protection because it still lets so many other bad things happen to your creature. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I agree with that. I just think, like, if your opponent resolves multiple threats that all have shield counters on them, it's going to start to get pretty annoying, especially if you're trying to, I don't know, Doomscar on turn four or something like that. I think it's uh, it's going to be pretty obnoxious to have to deal with. Yeah, so. yeah. Doomstar, Doomscar type sweepers are not going to like this. There's also, so this card in particular says that you may cast spells from the top of your library by removing a counter from a creature you control in addition to paying their other costs. It doesn't say play lands, and that's always mm -hmm. kind of a big problem with these top of the deck things is you need the top yep. of the deck to line up. So you need a spell on top of your deck, and you need a creature with a counter that you're willing to remove. And I mean, there's Luminar Cast Pirate. But I was going to say, I mean, it's a pretty sweet enabler. It's a pretty bizarre way to get your value, though, by putting plus one, plus one counters on things and then removing them. Because yeah. usually a board presence is worth a good amount. I don't know. I'm This card is weird, right? Four mana for a 3-3 three, three flyer isn't very exciting on it at, at any rate, I don't think. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I feel like it's probably not a hit. But, you know, I do have to say that, like, a 3-3 three, three flyer that potentially nets you another card and is resilient to like base level removal i think is at least something to look at yeah at least you but here's the thing if you frostbite it it doesn't die but you don't have a counter now to get a card yeah yeah um, but i mean you still have a three three flyer right i mean caca <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 maybe you'll win with that three three flyer it, it does trample so who knows yeah well Yes. Anyway, an interesting card, an interesting mechanic. Um, let's talk about this casualty mechanic. So I'm going to read this card, a little chat. Definitely getting up into the mafia stereotype here. One and a blue instant at uncommon with casualty one. So casualty, it reads, as you, <laughs> as you cast the spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power one or greater. When you do, copy this spell. So the number on the casualty tells you what power or greater the creature has to have in order for you to be able to do the thing. And then it says, look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the other on the bottom of your library. So pretty sweet mechanic. You basically get to like turn this card into a, like a deadly dispute if you want to. Um, I don't know, like what, what do you think of the card and the mechanic? I don't know. I I struggle with figuring out how to have creatures to sacrifice of like this appropriate power to get this duplicating effect. I I like that it does really? something if you don't sacrifice anything, but I I I like 
With I mean, deadly dispute, about, like, you get the treasure, you know? That's a big part of it, the mana and stuff. And this is kind of build your own draw to by giving up yeah. something. Yeah, but I mean, it's like look at two. I mean, look at four, take two, right? It's pretty good. Mm-hmm. I They go to the bottom. They don't go to the graveyard, the, the extras. Look mm-hmm. at four, take two isn't bad. I just... I don't know. So you, it's you, not you think deadly dispute... Me. Deadly dispute still on balance, Batsy, you think? I think so. I think getting a mm-hmm. mana back is a big deal. I, yeah. I don't know how many times I feel like I lose the game because that treasure just gave them this little boost and they're playing ahead of curve and I'm not, you know? I, I can yeah. think of a lot of times where it's just so hard to keep up with that. And a little chat is basically going down on your board presence, getting deeper, having the right cards, but you're still playing what I would define as fair magic. You know, I've got three yeah. mana, you've got three mana. My cards that I've selected are a little more uh, curated than yours, but it's not a huge advantage, I would say. So what do you think about having a sack effect that isn't in black? Like, that's pretty cool, right? In blue? Like, what yeah. are we sacrificing? They don't give us any tokens. Yeah, it could, like, let's say you have like an aggressive blue deck and someone points removal at your thing, right? Hey, it's happened, all right? Delve is in the format. What do you want from me? Aggressive blue <laughs> deck? <laughs> and, and when you have open mana, they just point something at your creature? This doesn't sound like a play pattern I'm used to. <laughs> no, I mean, it's Ever. been so long since we saw Ever. decks like, oh, I don't know, Rhodes. I'm just saying that they're, they're going to, I mean, good players are going to instant speed removal around you, leaving that stuff up. I guess they can't always. It's, I don't know. There's something about casualty is not clicking with me. Maybe mm. I need to see it All on right. some different cards. I definitely am not used to seeing it on my two mana draw spell. Other than Deadly Dispute, which I think is a very, like, special card for the decks that it goes in. Whereas I like my blue cards to be generically good, as opposed to I have to play one drops, and there really aren't that many I want to play. Yeah, fair, fair. All right, what do you think about this next card then, Jaxus, the Troublemaker? I feel like this card has at least some amount of trouble in it. (laughs) So do you want to read this card for us? I would love to. Jaxus, the Troublemaker, is three and a red for a 2-3 legendary creature, human warrior rare. This card has the ability red and a tap, discard a card. Create a token that's a copy of another target creature you control. It gains haste, and when this creature dies, draw a card. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Activate only as a sorcery. This card also has the ability Blitz, one and a red. Blitz is an ability that lets you uh, say if you would cast this spell for its Blitz cost, it gains haste, and when this creature dies, draw a card. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Is that clear? Do we understand the card now, everybody? I mean, I think that there's a lot to remember there. So that basically this card itself has Blitz, which is basically just thing gets haste, dies at the end step, you draw a card. And then it allows you to give, basically make a copy of something else that also has Blitz. So, I mean... On the face of it, if you're casting this for four and expecting it to live and yada, 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 it's got three toughness, like that's, you know, kind of Christmas land and whatever. But I think the ability to just like drop this for two mana and then use its ability immediately for one mana, I don't know. That could set something up, right? I'm not quite sure what it would be, but, you know, we all know there are like plenty of creatures with ETB effects and the fact that the token gives you a card when it like dies is pretty sweet as well so i don't know i could see someone going off of this thing so the 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 big question then is like what is the card that you're probably already playing because it's good that you would love to pay a two mana blitz cost and then a one red and discard a card cost to make a copy of that would go away at end of turn I know it draws you a card back, but that can't, you know, that's just a little consolation. Like, so what is the best thing to copy with this? That's, I think that's going to be an interesting question to answer. 
Mm -hmm. Town raised a tyrant. (laughs) Uh, Oh, I hate you. Thank you. uh, Thanks. I hate it. (laughs) I mean, Gold Spend Dragon isn't the worst. No, Um, that's an okay card. (laughs) Thundering Raiju. I mean, if you have two of them, that's dispensing quite a large amount of damage and potentially another counter. I don't know if it's good enough, but it's in the format. Um, Those are just in red, of course. I mean, how about one of them dragons? One of them mythic dragons? Are you in yet? Uh, Those are interesting to copy because you get the depth benefit and you can keep Mm -hmm. the... um, you can keep the copy and then that dies at end step. So you can get two death benefits Double. off of a dragon. Uh, the, the problem yeah. is we still have to play them in the first place. And I, I yeah, keep harping yeah. on them and they just keep yeah. getting exiled. It's I very mean, sad. That is a thing. That um, is a thing. Here's what I, can I, can I, can I get this, something about, there's a thing about this card that grinds my gears. Can I get feisty with this card? Oh, oh go off, go off King. The ability is called blitz. <laughs> But you still have to cast the card, which is a creature. It doesn't have flash, so it's a sorcery speed resolution. And then the ability can activate only as a sorcery. What is blitzing about that? I like when I read this card, just by the nature of the way the blitz was worded, I'm like, oh my gosh. So uh, when my opponent targets something with removal, I can like blitz this in and use the ability and make a copy of it. And that would be really cool. And no, there's two different ways that this is way too slow for something that cool. And that makes me, that grinds my gears, Arjuna. Don't call it blitz if it's slow AF. That's that's what I have to say. I, I mean, yeah. Uh... You got a point. The Blitz was, by definition, surprising, right? <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I, I think so. <laughs> that was the entirety of what I, it was supposed to be. I, so, uh, yeah, definitely not something you're supposed to see coming. But, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I hear that. And uh, who knows? I mean, I, I'm coming out conservative on this one. I think this yeah. is going to make some trouble with your wild cards is what I think. So Yes, um, I would definitely, you know, watch watch your favorite croquis uh, play this card and do something with it before you craft it yourself. But you know, pretty pretty sweet design. Literally and, uh, shouting out croquis on this podcast when I'm right here. <laughs> your favorite croquis, you said. Like there's no <laughs> other streamer options. <laughs> I'm, I'm. Oh my gosh. I'm calling my I'm calling my Please. agent. I need a new gig. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm saying is they don't call you Kovac Go Red. <laughs> He's right. All right, let's move on. <laughs> All right. Um I'm gonna skip over some of these cards because they don't look very good to me. Yeah. Um, why don't we talk about Elspeth Resplendent? Yeah. So uh, otherwise known as Amy the Amazonian, well-known magic streamer, looks exactly like her. So, Elspeth Resplendent, three white, white legendary planeswalker Elspeth at Mythic. This is a five loyalty planeswalker. Comes down and the plus one, choose up to one target creature, put a plus one, plus one counter, and a counter from among flying first strike lifelink or vigilance on it. Damn. Minus three. Look at the top seven cards of your library. You may put a permanent card with mana value three or less from among them onto the battlefield with a shield counter on it. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. And minus seven, create five three three white angel creature tokens with flying. So Elspeth Resplendent, definitely dishing out fairly powerful amounts of stuff. Uh, What are you thinking about this card, CGB? It's criminal that they didn't let Amazonian preview this card if they were going to just make it look exactly like her. <laughs> so right. I'm I'm gonna stand for Amy for a second and be like that that is some BS for sure. <laughs> um this card. 
So usually when you look at a Planeswalker, these are the classic stats. Like this is Obnixilis or uh, Jace Unraveler of Secrets stats. There was that period of time, like around Shadows over Innistrad, where every Planeswalker did the same thing. Five mana, five loyalty. The plus was usually something along the lines of get a card. The minus was usually something along the lines of kill a thing. And then there was an ultimate at like seven or eight. And this one inverts it a little. The plus is like power and toughness and abilities on the board, which, you know, leans towards a creature deck. The minus, if you're looking for a way for Elspeth to defend herself, has a deck building cost. You get to look seven cards deep, but you do have to play a good amount of permanent cards with mana value three or less that you would want to put on the battlefield with a shield counter. Now, it's interesting that it's a permanent card with mana value three or less, mm -hmm. because you yeah. could just hit a land. But mm -hmm. artifacts or enchantments that you could hit could have shield counters. That's shield kind counters. of interesting. So if you hit something like a Banishing Light, or whatever they're calling it these days, yeah. um, uh, and Blinding Light, I don't know. They, I forget the name. There's another Yeah, one. the Oblivion Ring, right? Yeah, the Oblivion Ring type cards. Those come in with a shield counter on them, which means if the opponent would destroy them, they can't. Of course, mm. Exile is still a problem. But um, that is kind of unique and might open up some deck building opportunity for a card like this that where you wouldn't see it otherwise weirdly i'm seeing this not necessarily in the main deck but like as a sideboard pivot for a deck like runes where the opponent mm. may not be prepared to deal with a planeswalker card type post sideboard and then you minus three this as a rune player you can get all kinds of things like rune force yep. champion and all of their creatures with a shield counter which is a big ouch that's that's a pain in the butt and if this sticks around all those abilities are brutal in runes so yeah uh, yeah no totally i it, it's a good point i mean just some other stuff that you could get with this even in the same color prevent uh, professor of symbology that's basically like a two for one off of your elspeth uh, you could get the i ganjo um saga right yeah which is kind of cool and i assume that keeps the counter even when it flips so oh well, no you it exiles right so mm -hmm. maybe it loses the counter now but the idea honestly the idea of this hitting redane like it turns my stomach. <laughs> That's a pretty nice hit. And no, I mean, you bring up a good point, which is that there are just a voluminous amount of three mana white cards that are really good. I mean, just think, think about this hitting like a Skyclave apparition. Like you got to feel pretty sweet about that, right? Yeah, that's annoying, but I'll just yeah. meat hook that stuff and I'll be fine. Yeah, or farewell, that's, that's true. You know, but they hit yeah. Redain. I'm never casting those spells again, ever. <laughs> it's impossible. It's impossible, yeah. Arjuna. Yeah. And looking at the top seven, that's a lot of cards. It's really so. Good. I think if you have some creature based combo, then this seems like a clear include because it just helps you find like part of your combo, which is cool. Um, it's powerful enough that I can see it show up in a number of different decks. And let's not forget if you are playing a creature heavy deck. Like a plus one plus one counter, and then like flying first strike lifelink or vigilance. Like one of those is gonna matter in whatever you're doing. So I don't know. I I mean, this isn't like immediately a slam dunk to me, but I feel like the power is there, and I think it could definitely show up. Do you think it makes it into white aggro as it's currently configured? I mean no, I don't think so. But I also think there's a world in which white aggro becomes like chonky white aggro. And it, it could definitely happen. And I mean, think about AO. AO kind of has similar synergies with this card. So I don't know. Maybe there's a world in which we, we're running like a slightly tubbio white deck. And uh, we're playing cards like this and vomiting all kinds of stuff onto the battlefield. And eh. Yeah, could, I think that's white. I think that's what white black mid range is now, and I don't know mm -hmm. if this goes in that deck necessarily either, because all the cards in that deck seem to play well from behind or ahead, and this mm -hmm. really only plays super well from ahead unless you build your deck in a manner to take advantage of playing from behind with the minus three, which not every deck mm -hmm. is built for. I mean, it sounds nice that you could hit a wedding announcement, but that's not great defense for your five mana planeswalker. I don't know. Yeah. Um. I'm not sure if this goes in like white aggro or white black mid range, but I do like crafting one or two if you're going to play best of three and trying it in runes. I, there's probably sideboarding opportunities for this card. 
Supposing this is hitting the three mana Kaya Planeswalker. Is that interesting? No. <laughs> no, that, that card is... So supposing we're storming the festival. Eh? Eh? I mean, eh? I mean you, you, you tell me about storming the festival, Arjuna. You're, you're the expert uh, now. I'm still, I'm still not off it, I guess. Yeah, um, so yeah, not, not perhaps an immediately playable Planeswalker, but... I, I would be surprised if Elspeth didn't show up throughout the life of the standard format that it's going to be in. Mm-hmm. Agreed. All right. Do you want to take us to our, our fiery red Phyrexian friend here? Oh, yeah. So we've got a Phyrexian causing trouble on yet another plane. This is Urabrask the Heretic Praetor. This is three and a red red, mythic, four, four, with haste. Very familiar stats to the last time we saw Urabrask in, uh, yeah. I have one from the secret layer that gets some play. But from here, it gets different. Very unique ability here. At the beginning of your upkeep, exile the top card of your library. You may play it this turn. At the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, the next time they would draw a card this turn. Instead, they exile the top card of their library. They may play it this turn. What do you think of this? Yeah, so, okay, it's kind of like a Howling Mine for you, which is cool. It basically gives you an extra look. Uh, so it's not quite like drawing a card, but still pretty good. You can play lands off of this. And uh, any kind of a card that's not like a counter spell, you're probably going to find some kind of a use for it. So that's pretty cool. And then, um, I mean, the ability will hit your opponent pretty hard, I think, as well. I mean, it really forces the issue on them playing whatever it is that they draw because they're not going to want to lose it. And it and it does skip their draw step. And I think that like it may not be apparent to the average person like how powerful that really is. <laughs> so uh, I, I i will say that twitch chat was very it, it took them a while to grasp how the card worked i was hearing a lot of like no they still get to draw a card i'm like no they don't <laughs> no they they saw sure don't <laughs> no they don't they saw sure don't so i mean mm, whether or not any of this makes this card better than a gold span dragon i don't know but um, it's definitely a card that if it sits in play is going to have a profound effect on the game. And the turn it comes out, it can do something because it does have haste. So that's a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I want to just, it, like, there's all this, like, secret, like, campaign against blue cards, man. And, and this is one of them. Because <laughs> if we, if, if this comes down and we draw a counter spell... It just goes into exile and we have to play it this turn. And of course, they're not going to give us a target. And we just basically nope. didn't draw a card. It just nope. it just hoses you. Not to mention, yeah. it's really frustrating being told what you have to play on your turn or else you lose it. That's how you end up playing off curve a lot. Playing off curve is its own disadvantage. Taxes does that in you know a very obvious way, like Thalia and Redain. But this does it in a very less obvious way. Um, so it's an interesting card for sure. It does unfortunately have the same casting cost as Goldspan Dragon, which probably renders it unplayable for a period of time uh, yep. because it's good, but probably not that good. But this card is obnoxious, and I think it's going to drive me crazy uh, at some point in the format, but I wouldn't craft it now. Yeah, yeah, this card is like... Uh definitely maddening to play against but also relatively easy to answer most of the used removal these days does hit it historic uh, uh, historic fans there's a combo with dranith magistrate that is just evil oh yeah that, that's pretty nice <laughs> see a little prison going on there yep i dig it i dig it so uh yeah another card to just keep an eye on all right, let's move on to the obviously Nixilis, because uh, this card is, has definitely made a splash, as it were. So, Ob Nixilis, the adversary. Not adversary, adversary. Mm. <laughs> let's see if this is better than the, uh, the last cycle of adversaries we talked about. One red, black, legendary planeswalker Nixilis, which I kind of find interesting. So, like... Nixilis is the last name, I guess. I, I, <laughs> don't call him Bob. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess so. 
Dude, don't call him late for dinner either. He's going to put a cap in your ass. Okay. Wow. Uh, he's so all right. Let, let's start over. Odd mix list the adversary one black red legendary planeswalker next list at mythic three starting loyalty. But wait, there's already an ability casualty X. The copy isn't legendary and has starting loyalty X. As you cast the spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power X. When you do, copy the spell, the copy becomes a token. So you can double this. We've seen a doubling effect on Planeswalkers before. Um, typically, the, the Planeswalker in question wasn't very good, so we'll see how this one stacks up. Plus one, each opponent loses two life unless they discard a card. If you control a demon or devil, you gain two life. Minus two, create a 1-1 one, one red devil creature token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. And minus seven, target player draws seven cards and loses seven life. I mean, it's a lot of action on a three-mana Planeswalker. Rate this joke on one to ten. Mob Nixilis. <laughs> I, I like Bob Nix. That's it. That's the joke. I, I liked Bob Nixilis better. Me too. Bob was a good guy. <laughs> He's from accounting. <laughs> kept his head yep. down. Did good work. All right. Um, so the casualty X thing is what gets people stirred up on this card. Because if you play on a curve of a creature on turn one or two, and then this on turn three, you have two Planeswalkers and a good amount of loyalty for three mana, which is a pretty bonkers rate. Like, we don't see yeah. that all the time. I, I, So Oko was three mana and went to six loyalty on first uptick. And that was... Mm. A lot to deal with. And people who faced the Oko meta will never forget. <laughs> it's just, it, it was impossible to kill. And there were powerful cards in that format, too. It was Eldraine. It was crazy. It was a crazy time to play Magic. There were three mana five fives, like Lovestruck Beast. And you still could not touch that Oko. It just was too thick. And if you have a Skyclave Shade, and you sacrifice your Skyclave Shade to Obnixilis on turn three... And then you plus both of your Planeswalkers, you have eight total loyalty. That's a lot That's of loyalty on two different things. So once yeah. one removal spell doesn't do it. Now, yeah. the plus one ability is considerably less powerful than the average like thing that's like make a food, draw a card, gain a resource. It's they lose two life unless they discard a card, right? And then you only gain the life if you control a demon or a devil. So for that to really be effective, you also have to pressure them, but it's hard to pressure them if you're also sacrificing your board presence. So the card is a little balanced in some awkward ways. It also leans into the thing that's going on in alchemy right now, which is the, um, God, what is the name of the card? Orvar. Orvar mm. the all Four meta, which yep. is uh, has the text that if you, disc if you were forced to discard this by an opponent, then it enters the battlefield as a copy of target permanent like that that is not what ob wants to happen so that could be a balancing act that could come into play that's a mythic i'm sure people would love to craft orvar <laughs> but anyway i it this card is cool at the very least this starts the imagination and it really plays into that like Oni Anvil Rakdos deck of just a lot of little cheap things going on that pile up to be greater than the sum of their parts. So I think this card is going to see a lot of play early on, and people are going to be trying to break this card very quickly. It's one of the more dangerous cards in the set, I think. I've heard there are some people already saying this card will be banned, but I don't think this is Oko 2. I think, uh, anyway, what do you think? Yeah, I mean it's interesting. <laughs> you can you can clearly let your imagination run <laughs> with this card. Um I mean, it's good to remember that like it really is on the face of it like a three mana planeswalker that spits out a devil and then maybe does something else, right? Now, those devils are easy to underestimate. They are actually quite good creatures. They can trade with X2s. They can point damage elsewhere if it's relevant. Um, if you are already racing for damage, which is what this card totally reads as, then um, they're a real asset. But I think it's, yeah, I think it's it's easy to 
<laughs> like overestimate how much this card is actually going to do for you when there are like likely scenarios where like your opponent just kills the creature, kills Omnixilis and moves on with their life, right? Um, or maybe, <laughs> you know, they point like a cheap burn spell at Ob, you're left with a devil, but it doesn't end up really mattering or whatever. So, um, well, you know, maybe like you you make a devil and your opponent just like skyclave apparitions orb and then it doesn't really matter so yeah hard hard to say i mean when you get to go off right when you get to do the like skyclave shade into the double of nixilis i mean that's gonna look pretty good right because then you can make like two devils and still have two planeswalkers left it's going to be very hard for your opponent to get through that next turn you can start ticking them both up so that looks pretty threatening, right? So definitely the curves in which that happens are gonna be like pretty busted, but um, yeah, I, I maybe I'll eat my words on this, but I currently think that Obnixilis is a little overrated. I, I would say the hype is probably higher than where the card will eventually come in, but I think that if you're interested in playing Rakdos decks, that crafting this and playing it won't be... I don't think it'll be a, a a failure. It might end up being a sideboard card before it's a main deck card, but I think it will be a player at various points in the format and will be a real pain to deal with. Now, I was having a really interesting conversation with my Twitch chat, and we even had some judges called in, and they didn't give me a firm answer. So I really want to know what you think. Mm. Can you copy the Planeswalker copy with Asika's Chariot? I think that you can, but I think it comes in with zero loyalty. You think it comes in with zero loyalty? Because the way it's phrased is you may sacrifice a creature with power X when you do copy the spell. The copy becomes a token. So yeah. doesn't the loyalty, wouldn't that lock in? Is it like it comes in with loyalty X? Like the token well, has this loyalty? Yeah, but no, I don't think so. Like the token comes in with the loyalty, right? But if you're making it uh, like, so the copy of the token is going to come in with loyalty X, which was the creature that was sacrificed to make it, right? Which in this case is zero. So my read on it is that it just enters the battlefield and immediately dies. I would agree that it, I would agree with that if it was an ETB, but it says as you cast the spell, like you determine the X. And if so, if yeah. you don't cast the spell at all, I don't know. Then you don't get an X, in my opinion. I, I would say so, but if like you snuck an Obnixilis into play, it would have the three. I, it's weird. And, I, and like I said, judges haven't been able to answer this. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm on team no, but uh, if you can copy, it's going to be pretty sweet. We're going to just just start to see all these random John token decks just trying to get value out of it. <sighs> well, definitely a very interesting card. Um all right, next up, let's talk about Strangle. One red mana, Sorcery. Strangle deals three damage to target creature or Planeswalker. The reason I'm bringing this up is that Frostbite saw an incredible amount of play. And uh, this is basically like, you know, Sorcery speed Frostbite that's always turned on. Yeah, without restriction. Think? I think it will see some play. I, mm -hmm. I, a, a lack of instant speediness is very notable on removal spells but yeah i mean there, there's no question that if it hits a wide enough range of the meta that strangle will see some play yeah yeah i th i think it's a card that's going to show up in some spots definitely uh all right why don't you read vivian on the hunt for us girl scout vivian <laughs> let's go <laughs> anybody want to buy some cookies <laughs> what are we looking at mint I'm seeing a mint cookie coming. Me too. Box of thin <laughs> mints, please. Uh, this is a this is an expensive planeswalker. This, this is, is a this is a thick mint over four, here. Four green green. <laughs> so six total mana. Legendary planeswalker Vivian, mythic rare. Four starting loyalty. The plus two says you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, search your library for a creature card with mana value equal to one plus the sacrificed creature's mana value. Put it onto the battlefield and then shuffle. And then the plus one is mill five cards. Then put any number of creature cards milled this way into your hand. And then the minus one is create a 4-4 four, four green rhino warrior creature token. So it's an interesting, there's three abilities. None of them are really an ultimate. 
all of them are, you know, the biggest thing is a plus two, and then there's a plus one and a minus one. So they're all just kind of regular Planeswalker abilities, no big flashy move. So what do you think? Six mana for this. What are you doing with this? Okay, here's my question. If this cost five mana, do you think it would be better than the last Vivian we got that, that like made tokens and fetched creatures and stuff? That's a good question. Because that made three threes, but they also had versatility, right? They could have reach, they could have vigilance. But but this Vivian, like, if this costs five, then you get, would be going up to six and potting up the turn that you played it, so you'd turn a four mana creature potentially into a five. I don't know. Oh, my head is the, spinning. The, I don't know, I, actually. The reason I ask, right, is that I feel like that Vivian ended up definitely being a player in the format of various spots, like in mono green decks and stuff. Yeah. Um, this one being one mana more and making a creature which is arguably not that much better than the other Vivian did. It, uh, yeah, I'm kind of feeling skeptical. I mean, okay, pumping out 4-4s four is pretty sweet. If you drop this, you get to make a 4-4 four four on the next turn, you get to make a 4-4 four four as well. You're definitely growing a very threatening board. So, I mean, you know, I mean, this is going to be like an absolute house and limited, for example. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah I, don't, I don't know. I don't know whether it's like too slow and a little bit too weak of an effect to see play in Constructed. It's a big difference be between a plus ability that makes creatures and minus ability as well, because every creature you make is making Vivian easier to kill. In the case here, you can pay six mana for this. Get a four loyalty planeswalker, take it down to three loyalty, make a four four. And if the opponent has a removal spell of almost any kind for the four four and a three power attacker, your Vivian is dead. And that's not yeah. a, that's not a good trade for your six mana investment, I don't think. I no. I mean if this card is going to matter, that plus two has to hit hard, I think, because potting up is people love like the birthing pod chains. And getting something for free with a really powerful ETB or maybe a death benefit could matter a lot. So I I think that's kind of the build around side of the card. And I don't know if that's worth it. The plus one is potentially a ton of value in a creature deck. Like if you, hit, true. if you hit two or three creatures off the plus one and then the opponent attacks this down but doesn't make it all the way to killing it and then you plus mm -hmm. it again, like you might drop four cards off of this pretty easily over two turns. That's a big yeah. reload. Maybe that's where yeah. the real sauce is. No, I agree. One of the things I think that's disappointing about this card is that it makes a token, but then if you sacrifice the token, you can only get a one drop with it, right? And I think that that's like, I don't know, maybe that's a safety valve or whatever. But I think for a six mana Planeswalker, it would be kind of cool if it used some other metric to decide how the potting happened. Uh, because I think the idea of like making a token one turn and then sacrificing the token into something really relevant could be like an interesting deck building challenge, right? So I think that that's like maybe a missed opportunity on the card that overall makes it weaker. But yeah, this isn't seeming like a banger to me at the moment. I think part of it is just that six mana planeswalkers historically have had to be like really good to see play. And uh, I'm not quite feeling it on this one. When you started saying what's disappointing about it, I was 80% sure you were going to say you can't storm the festival into it. <laughs> no, you know what's funny? Like, I didn't even think about that because I just wasn't even excited enough about the card. Like, if I could storm into this, I'm just not sure that I would care. Like, isn't freaking, like, Ren and Seven just better? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that Storm the Festival, at least for now, is the nail. Because if you're going to play up to six mana in your green deck with a bunch of permanents in it, like, wouldn't you rather Storm? Probably. Yeah, that's that's definitely my take on it. All right. Next up, what are we looking at here? <laughs> okay, how about let's talk about Gala Greeters. One and a green. Creature Elf Druid at rare. It's a 1-1. One, one. Alliance, this is a keyword ability. Whenever another creature enters the battle lead onto your control, choose one that hasn't been chosen this turn. Put a plus one plus one counter on Gala Greeters or create a tapped treasure token, which is, that's interesting. Or you gain two life. 
So the reason the tap treasure token is interesting is that it means you actually can't use it the turn it comes down, which is definitely a downside. But um, what do you think? Like uh, better or worse than the innkeeper? <laughs> it's an interesting bit of versatility on the card because it's got a little bit of innkeeper in it. It's got a little bit of Luminarch Aspirant in it. And two life never seems important until you're going to die. But then it actually does make a difference a good amount of the time. And yeah. it's the awkward part is like, another creature has to enter the battlefield, right? You have to play a ton of creatures, but it does yeah. say enter the battlefield. So if you make a token that does trigger this. So if you make yeah. like two or three tokens in a turn cycle, you can get a lot of these abilities. That's pretty crazy actually. Yeah, I guess that's true. So like, let's pass this out. Let's say that you play your Asika's chariot with Gala Greases on the table. I mean, that's a lot of power going on right there, right? You could make two treasures gain for life one a turn make one of these things a turn right it, it uh, has to be oh, that one hasn't been chosen, been chosen this turn yep. okay okay that's okay right so but i mean still right so let's say you make a treasure and gain two life or you know whatever whatever configuration works the best for you obviously if you have multiple of these it's going to start to get a little bit out of control um so yeah i mean i i see the power i definitely see the power and i agree that like it's going to be strongest in the token deck this will be a card that I think a lot of people are going to be trying and getting a look at. And it does seem to have a really high upside as long as you're playing a lot of creatures. So like, I don't know if I could play this in deck like runes because that's much lower creature count, high enchantment count. That enchantment density is what makes that deck tick. So are, are there decks in green right now that are just loaded with creatures I'm, i i just played elves in alchemy <laughs> they got all those buffs this is an elf so maybe if that's your jam uh i'm thinking of the green white decks like wandering emperor like can come down on their turn and trigger this and then on your turn trigger it again by making back-to-back sa -back samurais and yeah. then you play something else that turn i i feel like this card will I feel like this is going to be a heavily played card early, and I feel it might be the truth. It might be the real deal, because if you're enacting any kind of a game plan, making tokens, think of wedding announcement, you know, making sure that you're usually getting your triggers on this card. I, yeah. this, this might be better than an innkeeper. I, I can see a lot of ways that this is better than a prosperous innkeeper. Yeah, although like on turn two, it's often going to be worse, right? I mean, getting oh, that it's free definitely treasure worse. is so nice. It's definitely worse on turn three, I would say specifically, when you would normally use that treasure to ramp. Mm -hmm. Maybe this and innkeeper is the answer. Just Could be. Lots of extra mana, you know? I think this coming down on two, doing nothing, and then just getting like picked off by a shambling ghast or, you know, with a, a freaking, what's the, the red one one damage land right it's uh that's all gonna feel really bad spike field has it oh i mean yeah but all of those feel bad but at least this is a like a kind of a must remove you could say the same thing about luminar gas pirate you know well yeah except it's actually not susceptible to either of those things unless it's exactly like at instant speed right okay well, anyway, yeah, we'll see. But it, I mean, I agree. It does look like a fairly powerful card. Um, okay, now let me let me present you with an offer and see if you can uh, you can refuse it or not, CGP. <laughs> so uh, this is a one blue mana instant counter target non creature spell. Its controller creates two treasure tokens. What do you think? Take or refuse? No. <laughs> Give them two treasure tokens? No. I mean, Are okay, well, the cards, the cards called an offer you can't refuse. So did they just completely mess it up? I mean, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I suppose we're the one making the offer and yeah. the opponent's like freaking sweet. Yeah, the, I offer, cannot it, refuse the that. offer is they put their deadly dispute on the stack and we said, how about two treasures instead? And they're like, and they're I like, guess. Heck yeah, bro. <laughs> like, I guess I won't draw like two cards, you, but you lose a card and I gain two treasures. Sounds great to me. Dude, yeah, that's not good. <laughs> no, it's really not good. Like, 
okay, you're going to come up with like dream scenarios in which this is great or scenarios in which like this wins you the game, but there's an even larger amount of scenarios where you're really going to want to count your opponent's thing. So you do. And then next turn they have an extra two treasures and they go off and, and you lose. Like, I mean, let's say that you counter like that turn to Thalia with this thing, right? And then like you untap and do something, but then your mono white opponent is untapping with potentially five mana. Arjuna, like it doesn't even counter a creature spell. Oh, it doesn't counter a creature. Yeah, this is so disappointing. It's so bad. <laughs> I actually think as much as I'm going to hate on it, that this will see some play just on the point of being a one mana negate and that giving the opponent two treasures doesn't always lose you the game. Sometimes you just need to win that one big counter war and it doesn't really matter what the follow-up is because it was about the only thing that mattered. So I think this will see a little bit of play, but it's probably going to, especially when the set first comes out, see way more than it should. Like, yeah. way too much. Yeah, I'm imagining, like, there's going to be, like, some stupid, like, um, like aggressive decks that are, like, trying to play this to just take care of things and get the game over with, like, some silly Delver deck, right? Or whatever. And they're going to learn really, really quickly just how painful it is to give their opponent mana. Oh, yeah. Somebody's going to have this and Elite Spellbinder in the same deck, and you're just going <laughs> to laugh at them. <laughs> that is definitely a funny joke yeah and then you'll play this against your gold span dragon opponent and they will munch on your brain so uh fun times fun times indeed all right can i interest you in another casualty <laughs> casualty spell light m up one and a red sorcery at common casualty two so as you cast the spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power two or greater. When you do copy the spell, you may choose a new target for the copy. Light them up, deals two damage to target creature or blades walker. I'm curious why you wanted to read this one because I was going to completely ignore this. I have trouble seeing where I'd want to sacrifice a two power creature to deal four damage for two mana. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling on this one. How is no, this better I don't than think... a thundering rebuke? I, I don't think this is good either. I just think that people are also going to try to play this card, and I don't think it's going to work out. Oh, okay. I, I, I wonder. It, it didn't jump off the page to me, but maybe some red mages are really loving some idea. I wonder what they're thinking about sacrificing them. Because that's the thing of casualty two, right? It has to have two mm -hmm. power. That's... Mm -hmm. Mm, mm, mm. I don't yeah, like that. it doesn't feel that good. Um, I'm thinking about, like, okay, if you play this with Lolf looks a lot better right no <laughs> i think it looks better with lolf i mean i, don't, I, I mean everything look, looks a little <laughs> better when you have lolf on the battlefield let a me, let me chariot? you a seeker's chariot I mean, dude no nah, man i i don't i i just don't see what you're killing with two damage where you wouldn't have to pile it up you know are you talking about yeah. killing the opponent's two cats by sacking <laughs> one of yours I don't know your opponents to anything really. Yeah, I, I see. I don't buy that I, because I don't think it kills very much. I don't think two mana, two damage kills very much at all. Um. Yeah. No, I agree. It just seems like a bad card. Let's move along. Um. All right. Now there's a bunch of foreign language cards here, so uh, I haven't read any of these yet. Do you have yeah. a sense of which of these are worth getting into? Not exactly, so I'm just going to start grabbing some and inspecting them, I think. <laughs> but um, the first one, so the first one I have here is Maestro's Theater. Did you look at this one yet? Uh, the land? Yeah. Yeah, it's like, a, it's like a worse evolving wilds, right? I think so. You do gain a life. It's like a gain land meeting an evolving wilds, and it's a fetch land. It's really weird. Yeah. Like, yeah, I guess they're weird. common, so everybody will know what they do soon enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so here's my question is like, are we losing Evolving Wilds at some point in which this will be like the only option that we have for that at common? I mean, if if each of them, if there are five of them and they each cover like three types, then it, unless you're playing five color, you won't feel it, so it's fine. Yeah, I guess that's true. 
yeah, yeah, it is interesting. I mean, probably just worse than Evolving Wild. So like for any point at which Evolving Wilds is in this format, you're probably just not going to play this card. Probably not. But yeah, it's going to be sweet and limited. Hey, want to do cycles? You like cycles, especially rare I, cycles and mythic cycles. You have to read those unless they're strict saving a, cards. I am a cyclist. <laughs> yes, indeed. So um, let's check out the... I, I, I got to guess this is like the Ascendancy. Yeah. But yeah, it's a Grixis Ascendancy. It's in another language. So the official name right now, I'm not sure what it is, but it says Maestro's Dominion on Scryfall. Mm-hmm. And this is a Grixis Enchantment. Grixis for the enchantment. And it says, once during each of your turns, you may cast an instant or sorcery spell from your graveyard by sacrificing a creature, in addition to paying its other costs. If a spell cast this way would be put into your graveyard, exile it instead. Yeah, what do you I think? mean, it's a fun little deck building challenge. I think that this card is pretty sweet in a deck that runs cards such as Burning Down the House, right? Um, that sounds pretty juicy to me. That gives you three more hits basically in like the late game. So that can definitely give you a lot of finishing power. Um, how about a card like Stensia Uprising that makes a token every turn? mm, Yeah. But I mean, then we're talking about like a bad enchantment that makes another questionably bad enchantment. I've (laughs) I've won a lot of more games than I ever thought I would with Stensia Uprising. I mean, okay, fair enough. But like, what curve in which you're curving this into that? All right, How, like I'll only called Anvil then. <laughs> That's only two mana. It's in the colors. Yeah. Okay. I'm feeling that. I'm feeling that. I mean, that is an already proven, like, somewhat playable card in the format. Yep. I don't even know. Maybe that card's really good by now, and I just haven't even realized. Oh, that it, card's but... really good by now. Uh, Alchemy okay. is. Alchemy, it's getting played a ton, and it's getting like Rakdos is on the uptick in standard. Yes, it, it's, okay, it's in the tier two minimum category, fighting for tier one. Got it. Yep. Yeah, and I mean that card always looked threatening, so I'm definitely feeling you on that. That's pretty sweet. And the thing I like about that is that it has the potential to make you a creature before you play this card, right? Like, has a potential to so like you already have a creature at the beginning of turn four you can like already start cracking away with this kind of a thing. So you do have to pay the other cost for the card besides the sacrifice. So you're probably not flashing something back the turn you play the ascendancy or the dominion. I, yeah. that, that is a bit of a hit, but it is kind of this going forward effect where if they don't deal with it, you get double deadly dispute, you get double removal spell. That That's, yeah. that's really nasty. Yeah. It is nasty. I mean, you have to fund it with a constant stream of creatures. So oh. that's something. There's also no casting cost requirement. Like we're pretty used to every time there's a Snapcaster Mage type effect, there's a casting cost limitation. Like Bloodthirsty yeah. Adversary can only flash back things that are three or less. There's nothing like that here. You can flash yep. back Invoke Despair. Yes, you can. That's, na- and that's really I- nasty. Yeah, you can get up to some nonsense with like uh, unexpected windfall, discarding yes. an expensive spell, getting it back later, right? I mean, there are even spots where you might do something like, yeah, you you like discard and invoke, and then like you hit them with a gold span dragon, and then it doesn't feel good, but you sack your gold span dragon, and now you have like a bunch more spells and you might just end the game on the spot or something like that. So, I mean, I could definitely see turn sequences when that happens. Um, how's this for a combo? You have the freaking red creature land that makes tokens. Yeah. That's a combo. <laughs> I mean, if you've got a few mana, worst, right? Yeah. If you've got like some it, mana to go with it in the great. late game, that could really seal things up. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think this is a pretty scary enchantment. It's not, like Jess guy's ascendancy level of busted where it can combo off and win the game on its own. But how many turns can your opponent really last if you're casting like your best instance and sorceries twice? We, we learned from Lear that the answer is not very many. No. Yeah. No, indeed. I think so. Yeah. I think this, this card has a deeper deck building restriction than it might seem. I also like, don't think you're ever going to want to run this as a far off. Unless you have like some super busted deck that just relies on you always having one. Um, so just keep that in mind, crafties. I think you're going to see a bunch of really heinously awful decks with this card in it 
on the ladder and uh don't don't be that player yeah I, i'm more into like two i i think two is a pretty a, a good healthy number even when your mm -hmm. deck is mostly built with this in mind in some ways yeah yeah and there's a chance that this just ends up being the grixis in search of greatness how about maestro's diabolist so this costs a grixis blue black and red it is a creature vampire warrior at rare. It is a one for death touch haste. Whenever Maestro's Diabolist attacks, if you don't control a devil token, create a tapped and attacking one, one red devil creature token with when this creature dies, it deals one damage to any target. Um, interesting card, CGB. What do you think? Well, you wanted to fuel your Grixis Ascendancy, which is what I'm going to call it until we get the actual name. But the <laughs> card we just discussed. If you wanted to fuel it, I mean, if you have kind of any sacrifice a creature outlet including mm. the what what's the name of the ability that is grixis yeah the, it's not the connive it's yeah the one where just casualty casualty yeah if you yeah. if you're looking to fuel your casualty creatures or do any kind of sacrificial stuff you can just keep sacrificing the devil and creating a new one uh, with your next attack step it does have to survive the attack which is not always easy as anything with like a three toughness is happy to jump in front of the devil. But this particular, like this card itself is really hard to kill. Can mm, like yeah. can you can you name things that kill this easily? I you don't want to infernal grasp against somebody playing like devil synergies, like your life total matters. So yeah. you can power word kill it. Um what else? What can you do yeah. against this on good rate? Yeah, no, you can't really. You've got like what you've got um the kill saga, what's it called? The uh why am I forgetting the name of it? The kill saga. Yeah, you know, binding the, the, old the gods? Golgari, yeah, binding the old gods. So you got mm. you got binding okay. the old gods. Um You've got maybe Dragon's Fire. If you've got a, a Dragon out. Yeah, Dragon um, Fire is getting leaned on more mm -hmm. and more as this set is getting revealed. But yeah, this is another yeah. one that's really hard to kill with the cards that are conventionally used to kill things these days because just the goldness is good against Vanishing Verse. For Toughness is a lot against a braid and things of that nature. It's a re this is a really pain in the butt kind of card, and it's a vampire. And there's some vampire leftover synergy from Crimson Vow that didn't quite get there, but this is this is a pretty good card. If you have like yeah. two of these going, you're making a lot of. I, I guess that doesn't help much, right? Because it only works if you don't control a Devil Token, so it's not good in multiples. That's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, but no, I, I agree. I think the card has plenty of potential. It's a powerful card. Um, if you get it down on time, especially if you are the aggressor, it's going to be quite threatening. So yeah, don't underestimate those red devil tokens. Those things are nasty. Um, all right, why don't you read us Evelyn the Covetous? All right, Evelyn the Covetous for two generic, a hybrid Demir, a black, and a hybrid Rakdos. Five total mana, <laughs> easy. Uh, you get a 2-5 legendary creature vampire rogue. This is rare. Has flash. And whenever the this Evelyn or another vampire enters the battlefield under your control, exile the top card of each player's library with a collection counter on it. Once each turn, you may play a card from exile with a collection counter on it if it was exiled by an ability you controlled. Weird. And you may spend mana as though it were any color to cast it. Um, so I'm guessing collection counters are like elsewhere or they just don't want you dipping into other people's covetous collections I, yeah so yeah it's like weird wording but the net effect of the card is every vampire you play is potentially more cards to cast because you're building this collection of cards from every library in commander four players but on arena it'll be like one you know you and your opponent uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of like plusing a tibble right mm -hmm. plusing a seven mana tibble um, so that's, a that's quite the effect for only five mana to just turn that on. Obviously you want a bit of a vampire tribal action, but I don't know. Is this, I, you could see a lot of cards with this. Is this a good card? 
Here's my question. Both depictions of this card show this lady stabbing a knife into a painting. What's that about? <laughs> um, and the painting <laughs> looks like her. Yeah, it's kind of... Like it's wearing this... the same jewelry and the same outfit? I, There's something really weird going on here, and I'm not quite sure what it is. Yo, she twisted. I do you think that the <laughs> painting is somebody that she's trying to replicate that you know she was covetous of? Like it like she's she bought their house, now she lives in their house, dresses like them, and just goes around stabbing their paintings. <laughs> I'm it's, trying. I man. mean I'm trying. She's she's <laughs> like the vampire equivalent of the crazy cat lady, right? Sure. So yeah, she's the crazy stabbing a painting in the eye lady. This painting's bleeding as well, which is kind of, everything about this is just weird. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, getting back to your question. Um, all right, so you don't get to do the thing if she's dead, right? Once each turn, you may play a card from exile with a collection counter on it. If it was exile by an ability you control, you may spend. I believe this. I believe that Evelyn has to be alive on the battlefield. Yeah, or some Evelyn and Evelyn must be alive. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that makes the card quite a lot worse. If you could just play them like for the rest of the game. Flash, uh, Flash helps a lot with that. That's true. You can pick your spot yeah. and you'll probably have access to at least two cards to choose from on one turn cycle. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, and I mean, okay, so in Commander, it's going to be sweet because you get <laughs> four hits right off the bat, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's still okay. I mean, I guess like you flash this in on five, you get like two cards to look at. I mean, it's a five drop, which sucks. Like, I think you're... Your two five flash, you probably want to be like ambushing something with this, but then your opponent just kills it post combat. So I'm, I'm trying to decide: would you play five mana, two five flash draw two? Would you? Yeah, I mean, it's close, right? It's close, but here's the thing: it's actually not close because, like, you get the ETB, you draw two. Even if your opponent kills it, you still drew two, right? So I mean. That's like a huge difference, really. Hmm. I mean, if it lives, then it's somewhat approximate, right? But again, like, think about it. Like, if you exile your opponent's counter spell or whatever, like, you're going to want it to stick around a while so you can actually get value out of that card, right? So, yeah, I'm kind of off it, to be I, honest. I, I'm, I'm kind of used to, like, flash threats that are must-kill, like, immediately now. Th those are mm. typically overperformers, though. Yeah, but for five mana, five is five is a lot. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm closer to like, I'm I'm close to like a two of. Okay, I, I think a Grixis mid range deck could run two of this and be happy about it. But I also think that it would be great if you had more vampires, and I'm not yeah. sure how many playable vampires we're going to get. Yeah. Yeah. It could end up being like a, a top end in a vampire deck, but I don't know. Everything about this screams like slow, clunky, and weird to me, which is basically like the three Grixis keywords, right? So, well, I, I think it's also <laughs> worth noting the way that, because it's hard to picture if they're listening on the podcast, the way that the hybrid man is laid out, you can run this in Rakdos or Demir. Like, you don't have yeah, to be that's full true. Grixis. Or, or mono black, which is sweet. Or mono black, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that that does give the card a lot of versatility. Yeah, this but... and blood on the snow, just keep collecting, baby. <laughs> oh, there you go. Now we're talking. All right, I want to read this next card, not because it's good, but because it's just so freaking wacko. Like, I mean, come on. Let's so go. arcane, arcane bombardment, four red, red enchantment at mythic. So, what does this remind you of, CGB? <laughs> Uh, uh, four red, <laughs> red enchantment at mythic. So I'm I'm getting like mirror march flashbacks or whatever. Okay, <laughs> I mean I guess I've got a yeah I've got a I haven't absorbed the text so yeah what do we got? Okay, so whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, exile an instant or sorcery card at random from your graveyard. Then copy each card exiled with arcane bombardment. You may cast any number of the copies without paying their mana costs. So 
The first time you do this, you get one free spell at random. The second time you do this, you get the first one that you picked and the second one that you get at random and you get them both. Really? Right? Yes, that's the way it works. Copy each card exiled with Arcane Bombardment. So yeah, in like the history of its life with this Arcane Bombardment. So, yep. okay. So over, uh, over time, I mean, if you get the second trigger, you are doing it, right? Oh, this now is they like are the, at random, yeah. which kind of sucks. You don't know exactly what you're going to get, but it's in your deck, so you should assume it does some things. But it makes you really want to play less counter spells and more generically proactive cards. So, like, yeah. you have a consider in your graveyard, and you have um, yeah. a draw to in your graveyard. This would not be good with Memory Deluge because you would get no cards, but like a Behold the yeah. Multiverse in your graveyard. Or one of mm -hmm. the charms. Oh, God, the charms. This charms. with the charms is great Gross. because they're modal and you get to choose different modes. Gross. Um, yeah. I mean, this this can be a win con, right? If you have any spell that can do face damage, I mean, like, heaven forbid you have, like, a, like a Prismari command kicking around. You get to fire off one of those every turn. It's going to feel pretty amazing, right? Yeah, so this is the thousand-year storm of the set. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. you know already if you're going to spend your mythics on something as meme as a thousand-year storm, then this is for you. And yeah. for the competitive minded or the very conservative with my mythics gamers it's definitely not for them this is for a very yeah. specific type of magic player yeah this is like the saffron olives of the world the ali eldrazi's of the world maybe occasionally the chris patellos of the world you know who you are um yeah the rest of you don't craft this unless a of all you're willing to see your wild cards go down the drain or B of all, it just looks like the funnest, sweetest thing ever, and you can't help yourself. In which case, have fun. Magic's all about having fun. They're going to discard their magma opus to make treasures to play this sooner, and then they're going to try to exile magma opus with it. They're going to do the thing. things. Do the things. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. This, this yeah. card is nonsense. Someone's going to have fun with this card. It might be you. Who knows? It probably won't be me, but I, I, <laughs> Mono Black Magic on YouTube will have a lot of fun with this card. Okay, um, let's talk about <laughs> Professional Facebreaker. You want to read this one? I think th this card just speaks to my soul with the title, you know? <laughs> it's Professional I mean, that's, Facebreaker. That's basically what you are, Kovac. Yeah, it's like that, except this is a red card. So this is two and a red for a 2-3 human warrior at rare with menace. It has the text, whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to a player, create a treasure token. And then it has more text, sacrifice a treasure, exile the top card of your library. You may play that card this turn. I'm I'm feeling this card, man. Like, Dude, it, it's, it's sick. It's On its own, it's like a three mana does nothing when it enters the battlefield and then you need to attack with it and it's a medium body. But it's not meant to be played alone. It's meant to be on the play, one drop, two drop, professional face breaker, get in there, make some treasures, play some more stuff, or wait till next turn and sacrifice them and get some stuff that you can play. I yeah. like it's a combination of mana advantage and card advantage and the only thing it absolutely demands of you is that you are a professional face breaker <laughs> that you actually hit the opponent in the face with your creatures and there are plenty of red decks designed to do that job indeed indeed i mean i mean come on like turn on eye twitch great start to a card like this right i mean that basically just makes like your evasive flying threat that your opponent already doesn't want to spend a card killing that much better right because don't forget you can drop this card on turn three smack your opponent with your flyer you get a treasure right then that's an excellent deal so i mean that's that feels like you know it's not quite the floor on this card but in a lot of decks that's kind of what it's going to be like right a little sidetracky but important to mention it's interesting to see strong monocolored cards in this set because it's meant yeah. to be a tricolor family you know shard shard wedge set but when yeah. you introduce a card like professional face breaker which only takes one red and two colorless i believe it fits into four families everything but brokers right 
Yeah. Or no, not the Esper one. Okay, well, so, so it fits yeah. into three families. Three, um, three of the five, yeah. But that's still a lot of deck building potential for a card like this. And that's not to mention putting it in decks that are already uh, in standard in, you know, like Rakdos, as you mentioned, or um, just mono red, Boros, all the professional face breakers out there. Indeed, indeed. And I mean, those are some pretty nasty looking uh, brass knuckles. So uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't tangle with this thing unless you're really ready to go for it. Um, yeah, I I like the card. Another thing to note is like if you bank up some treasure and you drop this later in the game, you can just boom right away start getting those treasures off the top and see if you can hit something else. Another card so, that looks really good with Oni Cult Anvil. Because it's yes. sacrificing the treasure, seeing another card, triggering the anvil, making another creature. Ooh. Yep. Yep. It could get pretty ugly. So um, definitely keep my keeping my eye on that. Um, all right. What else are we looking at here? Um, can I interest you in make disappear? So <laughs> one. <laughs> that one, sounds one, like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting card. One and a blue instant. Casualty one and counter target spell unless it's controller pays two. So, okay. On the face of it, a strictly worse spell pierce, but it has a lot of upside. Uh, or you could say a strictly better quench, which yeah. is a card that's. I aged. guess that's true. That card is aged pretty well. It doesn't see a ton of historic play, but I tell you, when you run it in historic brawl, people hate it. <laughs> like like that card is is very playable in historic brawl just because of the nature of like the scaling format and the commander tax and things of that nature um yeah. i expected when you started reading this card i expected it to say non-creature spell or creatures no they you're right limited yeah but no it is just a quench it is just so. straight up counter target spell unless its controller pays two and if you have a creature to sacrifice it's two mana counter target spell unless its controller pays four or yeah. You can do tricky stack stuff with this yeah. where you target one thing with a copy and another thing with another copy if you get into a little scrap on the stack. That's, totally. This this yeah. card is this card might really tilt some people. Yeah, and I mean, remember how much play Quench saw the last time it was in standard. I mean, that was like that like that was the card you just hated to lose to, and it happens so often. So yeah. Don't don't misunderestimate Quench. I mean, strong card. And Quench did not see see play alongside Jwari Disruption. As it mm. is right now, people are playing around Jwari Disruption. Can you imagine mm. the feels bads when you play around Jwari and then you get Make Disappeared? So then the next turn you're like, well, I need to resolve something, and you walk into the Jwari? Ugh. That's rage-inducing, yeah, man. It's nasty. That's yep, so mean. The taxes are going to be flying around. Oh, so. it's gross. Yep. I'm also um, going to, I think from now on, when it gets to that hour of the night, you know, when every, when all your friends want to keep partying and keep going and nobody wants to call it, but you know, like you've peaked, you know, yeah. it's all downhill from here. I think yep. from now on, my term is going to be make disappear. Make CGB disappear. make disappear now. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, love it. I mean, it's a great way to end a stream too, right? It, you, just, you know what? I'm just going to make this appear right now. This, this podcast may have peaked. I don't know. <laughs> oh, this podcast definitely peaked. Let's make no mistake about that. Um, okay. Let me finally read. He that sees you when you're sleeping is what Scryfall thinks its, its name is. Well, we're going to read this no matter let's, what. Okay. Let's go into this. So why, why don't you do the honors, CGB? So it's in another language. So we're reading the translation of a card that has the tentative title on Scryfall of He That Sees You When You're Sleeping. Which... He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. All right. Confirmed Santa Claus in New Capenna. What's up? I mean, I'm looking at the art and I'm seeing... Why am I blanking on the name? There's too many superheroes nowadays, but the guy from The Watchmen. Oh, yeah. I uh, I haven't actually seen that, but I know what you mean. Hey, I'm going to get roasted if I don't come up with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, my gosh. You know, the the guy. He's he's blue. I do know the guy. 
<laughs> I know exactly what you're talking about. Oh, the comments are going off. I guess there are worse things in life than having people comment on your video. All right. Um, and I keep on wanting to say Mr. Universe, and that's not it either. That is definitely no. not it. Um, Dr. Manhattan. Okay. There it is. There you go. Good job, CGB. Thank Honor is done. No editing needed. Didn't Google. <laughs> Got there. Just took a minute. All right. This is an avatar. And this creature is a 5-4 with flying. And it says, whenever, quote, he that sees you when you're sleeping, unquote, enters the battlefield or attacks, draw two cards, then discard a card. The next part of the text is whenever you discard a card, target creature an opponent controls gets minus X minus O. No, gets, yeah, minus, okay. I'm. It, it's like on a line. It's hard to read. Yeah. So I'm going to try that again. Whenever you discard a card, target creature an opponent controls gets minus X minus O until your next turn, where X is the number of different mana values among cards in your graveyard. What a CGB, weird card. CGB, when you, when you started reading this card, I was excited because I was like, it's a six mana mythic flying 5-4 avatar that draws two and discards one. This next line is going to be epic. And it's really not. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a line of text you can put on a card, I guess. Uh, you're probably going to be giving an opponent's creature minus three or minus four, uh, minus O until ne your next turn, basically nullifying its ability to attack you. But that's not very exciting, is it? Like, in, nope. in a constructed context, that's rarely a strong enough ability to build a card around. So nope. now we have to analyze this as six mana, five, four flying, enters the battlefield, draw two, discard one, which that makes me think of Mordenkainen. And normally at this cost of Planeswalker doing that ability on a plus two is a lot is better than a five, better. four. And Mordenkainen yeah. is not constructed playable Didn't. right now. Well, not, not right now. I, I'm probably like the 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 lone modern kind and gamer, but yes, that card most of the time did not get there. So, yeah, we definitely peaked before CGB. We should have just called it. <laughs> You're right. I, you know what? Then maybe maybe in lieu of the situation that has occurred from he that sees you when you are sleeping, we should uh, make disappear. What do you think? Let's. Let, let's make disappear CGB and uh, leave no more casualties of this podcast. So thank you for joining us, crafties, the OCs, the original crafties. Um, it's been fun serving you again for another week of arena content. You can find this show on Spotify. You can find it on iTunes and all the various other places you can find podcasts. You can see Covert Go Blue and myself in the video version of this podcast on Covert Go Blue's YouTube channel. Uh, you can also watch Covert Go Blue stream on a weekly basis at twitch.tv forward slash Covert Go Blue. You can see me stream very sporadically these days at uh, Twitch Arena Craft Podcast. Wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons. You are the life's blood of this show. You keep us going. You keep us motivated, even when we're reading bad cards for you. So thank you very much. And... Um, CGB, um, I can't wait until next time we record this podcast when I make you an offer you can't refuse. Is it two treasures? I, I, I mean, I guess you called me out, bro. I, I don't know what to say. Later, crafties. <laughs>